Hi, welcome to the session. Some then does not like it hot, uh, leveraging data standards for mode ship and climate change. Uh, we have the chance to have three panelists with us today. I will be presenting them to you in a second. First of all, who I am, I'm Elizabeth, I'm the Deputy Executive Director at Mobility Data. I'm based here in Montreal. I'm a mobility enthusiast since I'm born, uh, but I also look how we can create mobility that is equitable, uh, sustainable, and also um, um, socially responsible. I speak French, English, and a, a bit of Spanish too. My pronouns are she, her. All right, so the agenda today will have a, well, I'm doing currently the panel introduction. We'll then have a session with Transport Data Gouv with Antoine. Then we'll have a session uh, with Flaubert and Olivier. And finally, we'll have a session with Andy from Eto World. And uh, this will be continued by a panel discussion and a Q&A. So the reason of that session, it's not a surprise, things are heating up. But then how can we encourage model uh, shift to stop or at least mitigate climate change? So with that idea in mind, we designed that session and we have our great uh, panelists that decided to join us. I'll do a really quick introduction to our three panelists. So first of all, we have Antoine Augusti. He is a senior software engineer working at the French National Access Point for Transport Data Gouv. He previously worked at the Canadian Digital Service and at the French Prime Minister Services on data policy and data-driven products. Secondly, we have Olivier Warat. He's the Fair and Data Collection Director for Canada and the USA at Flaubert. He has an engineering degree of École Centrale in France. He is accumulating more than 20 years in security and mobility in various organizations, such as the Vinci Group, Conduant, and General Electric. What brings him with us today? Olivier is in charge of mass and open loop payment for Flaubert. And finally, we have Andy Walker. He is the commercial director for ITO World and has spent over 30 years growing leading edge software businesses. His career includes 10 years in the geospatial industry and 10 years with McLaren Applied Technology, helping businesses harness the power of data through the use of technology originating in the highly data-driven environment of Formula One Motorsport. All right, that is it as an introduction. Uh, so let's start. Okay, um, so I work at uh, the French National Access Point to Transport Data in France. Um, so basically our mission is to gather our French mobility data. So we want to provide data about how you move in France and about the transport infrastructure in France. Um, so we, we are in charge of, uh, we don't produce everything, we don't publish everything, but we are in charge of making sure it's available, um, etc. And we work with a lot of uh, a wide range of uh, data. So of course, uh, public transit, so buses, trains, tram tramways, and stuff like that. But we also uh, have data about the rail transport, carpooling places, refueling station, bicycle network, etc., uh, etc. Et Everything about transport infrastructure. Um, and our mission is really to encourage the uh, use of sustainable mo mobility solution. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, if people can, uh, they should be able to use uh, public transit when they move around either in their city or when they travel. Uh, if you're coming to France, hopefully uh, you will be able to benefit from trains or public transit as well. Um, and we want to raise awareness and encourage data producers to open their data. So basically, uh, we've got a lot of uh, public agency in France. Uh, in France, uh, we've got uh, more than 300 uh, agencies responsible for operating uh, uh, buses and trams uh, in their jurisdiction, so in their city. So we are working with all of them to make sure that they open their data, that it is available of good quality, that it is not updated um, and it is available. Um, we want to make sure that we are um, um, a, an intermediary between a producer and reusers. So we work with cities, uh, agencies, operators, and also reusers like uh, Google Maps, Apple, CityMapper, um, researchers, and uh, other private companies to make sure that they've got the data they need to do their work, uh, to um, um, to do their best work, uh, be it like a, as a route planner, provide development opportunities and stuff like that. We also originate from um, a, new, a European directive, um, which is uh, called, uh, which was called uh, Loi de Mobilité in France, uh, which uh, gives a wide range of uh, uh, things to do uh, to to stem the to to, to give uh, um, 
a cap to, to, to reach that sustainable mobility, uh, which is like a national access point uh, and to uh, promote uh, other uh, stuff like that. Um, carbon emission in France, uh, uh, coming from transport, is uh, one third uh, of the carbon emission in France. And uh, like uh, um, vehicles, like private vehicles, uh, account for half of that. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do. And this is one of the sectors that has still increased in the recent years in France. So like, it's really crucial to, to work on that. Uh, so yes, I, as I was saying, we've got a wide range of data, static data, uh, and also real-time uh, data. Uh, so you see, we've got uh, more than 400 data sets. Um, so we've got a website uh, listing all of them uh, with the various uh, tools. Um, but uh, as you see, uh, our, our big topic is, of course, public transportation, um, bikes, um, carpooling, and on-demand vehicles, and and stuff like that. Um, we've got a wide range of features on our website. Um, we, we are not just uh, a catalog listing uh, uh, feeds or files. Uh, we try to provide rich features, uh, such as like a visualization, uh, just to get an idea of what's inside the data before actually working with it to make sure it fits your need, uh, that it is uh, representative, that it is accurate of the real world. Um, we uh, know that also some, uh, that some uh, data fields are hard to understand for non-technical people. So we try to provide like a visualization to get an idea of uh, what's inside, like for example, a DGFS RT uh, feed, like service alert saying like uh, there are road work, uh, there are construction, uh, there are some services, uh, some, some lines that are not operating uh, and stuff like that. Um, and we also like, uh, I've got a role to report on the offer in France. So for example, we look at uh, Download availability. Is it uh, slow to, to to download? Is it uh, working uh, all day all day long? Is it fresh? Uh, stuff like that uh, on uh, various uh, aspects. So what do we do to promote sustainable mobility? So the French government is doing uh, various uh, uh, things to promote sustainable mobility, from uh, uh, electronic vehicles, giving compensation, uh, like. Uh, making sure that uh, the fuel process is not too cheap, stuff like that. But our team, um, basically, uh, we chose to focus our efforts on public transport, bikes, carpooling, and car sharing first. Uh, because, like, uh, for example, uh, uh, plane data is not really open in France. But if you want to do, take a plane, it's easy to uh, like book a plane ticket, compared to actually when you travel uh, to know uh, what is the best, uh, how much is it going to cost, am I going to be able to get back to my place at night, uh, it's uh, far, uh, far more difficult at the moment. So this is where we need to act on. Um, and again, uh, like it works mostly uh, in, uh, in big cities. So if, if you're taking a public transit in, in Paris, it's going to work well. It's going to be uh, available and uh, easily uh, uh, for you on a wide variety of apps. But if you're going to smaller places, it's going to be more difficult and not accessible sometimes. Uh, and we want to, to be uh, improving that. Um, and for bikes, uh, for example, we work on a lot of uh, uh, providing like, uh, data about the uh, existing infrastructure. So uh, bike lane, bike ways, bike parking, uh, how much it costs, is it new, is it in good condition, is it going to be built soon or not, uh, to report on that. Um, and make sure it is uh, available on uh, uh, widely available uh, apps like uh, Google Maps, uh, CityMapper, Apple Plan, so that uh, when you want to travel, you know that you can use an appropriate route uh, when you, you bike. Uh, for carpooling, we are in charge of um, uh, adding a national database of car, uh, carpooling places where, where you can stop and pick up people safely uh, in, in a good uh, way in cities. And then it's used by private companies uh, in their apps uh, to have like a, a range of location. Um, and city, uh, then I've got some data about the use of carpooling places in uh, their juris jurisdiction. Um, we also have the chance to have an appropriate and ambitious legislation, um, which says a, a lot of things in France. Uh, we've got a compulsory open data, meaning that if you operate uh, a mobility solution in France, uh, like, like, such as a bike, scooter, a train, if you're a private operator, you have to open up your data. You have to do it uh, with a standard. You have to do it for free. Um, and you have to pick a limited set of licenses uh, so that it's not, uh, it doesn't restrict uh, the usage you are going to make of the data. Like uh, you cannot forbid uh, someone to use your data, for example. So it's really important and we, we work with everyone uh, to make sure uh, it's, uh, it's done. Um, we uh, make sure that we comply with standards. Uh, so uh, 
if you got a pretty uh, transit uh, data, it's important that it's going to be published in GTFS or in a European standard so that, such as NetX. Uh, so we make sure that this is the case. And if it's not, uh, we will talk with people to make sure that they know that uh, it should be done and to ask about uh, what, is, what is planned and, and things like that. We ensure that uh, reutilization is free for small users. So it's uh, sometimes difficult to provide free uh, API for real-time data because we know it has a cost to operate uh, infrastructure, but we make sure uh, sometimes that uh, we step up uh, to uh, provide the infrastructure or the tooling or the expertise uh, so that the data remains free to use. Um, and when it's really like a, uh, already um, in private use or wide range of use, we, we've got legislation in place to, to put a cap or limit on the pricing you can charge uh, for your time data so that uh, it's actually used. Um, we also have some uh, levy to force uh, people to reuse some data sets uh, when they operate in France. So if you're a, a route planner in France, there are some data sets that you are forced to reuse uh, in, your, in, your, uh, in your application. You have to use it. We make sure it's available, that it is of good quality, and we work uh, with everyone to make sure that they, they know that uh, they're supposed to include it. Uh, stuff like uh, low emission zones, uh, some parking spots and, and stuff like that, and more uh, in the coming years, um, so that uh, uh, we've got a, at least a basic uh, offer on mobility in each uh, uh, road planning application. Um, and we also have, um, so this is not that, uh, an independent authority, uh, a, a regulator, to check that uh, the legislation is properly applied. Um, and they can do uh, audit, they can ask for reports, they can visit uh, people in offices, and they can provide penalties if uh, the law is not applied, uh, meaning that you didn't open your data or you didn't uh, work with us uh, in the end, uh, or you didn't, we didn't move in the right direction or too slowly, for example. Uh, so they are here to help uh, this as well. And uh, our team, so we've got a, a team of uh, software engineers, uh, business developers, and also uh, policy uh, experts. So they actually write the law, uh, so they are able to edit it. It takes months, it takes uh, often years in Europe, uh, but at, at least it will, be, uh, it will be done, and it will be done by our team, so that's uh, really good to be able to, to do that. Um, we uh, create standards when they don't exist yet, uh, so uh, GTFS is very good, so we are not going to, in to reinvent something, for example. Uh, but uh, some things are, are specific or are not yet standardized. So uh, when it's not, when it's appropriate, we step up and we work with the ecosystem to make sure that uh, we land on something uh, that is uh, uh, feasible for them to produce, uh, that is uh, easy to understand, and that uh, people are going to be able to, to create it. So for example, careful places, bicycle counting, to make sure that uh, when you, you ride a bike, it's uh, counted and it's not like a seen as a leisure mode of travel, but it's actually like an active mode of travel. We want to, make, we want to promote it, so we work on that. Um, and our team like, uh, creates and provides free tooling uh, to produce like, uh, quality data. So we provide validation, we provide uh, uh, expertise, we provide consulting, uh, and it's available for cities and authorities to use. Uh, they can go to our platform, they can uh, give us their files, their, their feeds, and we give them uh, rich reports uh, and validation to, to say that, uh, yes, this is appropriate, you need to work on that. They can share that with their partners, their uh, third party or private companies to actually fix issues if, they, if they've got any. And we've got a, a role to report on the availability of foreign friends. So sometimes it's not going to be nice. We will see that uh, a map is uh, a bit... Uh, we don't have a mobility offer in some uh, region, departments, but it's also um, uh, something we have to do, like to make sure that uh, we report on what's available, what's of good quality and what's not, what doesn't exist yet, uh, so that uh, we can actually pinpoint issues uh, and work on it uh, together. So that's what we do. And yeah, so I've got uh, a few uh, uh, screenshots, uh, for example. So uh, this is my, my city, I live in Dijon. And uh, on the web page, uh, we've got uh, like a, uh, a GTFS. We say that it is up to date. It goes up to this date. So we've got a validation report. We've got real-time resources saying that uh, I've got a, a feed with a vehicle position, trail updates. You can click on it. Uh, you know if it was available over time. If, uh, if uh, there were downtimes, if it was slow, it's going to be shown here. 
and we, we provide also the information about uh, everything like that on the web page, but also uh, through the API so that uh, uh, you don't have to actually manually browse our website to know about it. You can use the API and automate it if you want to. Uh, and this is uh, the preferred way because, uh, as I said, we've got like more than 300 in agents in France, so we, we, it's uh, hard to manage if you do it uh, by, by hand. So yes, this, this is the page I was uh, talking about. So yeah, we report that we say we've got a, a few warnings for this uh, GTFS, so maybe we look at it. Um, so we've got some information. We've got a, um, a visualization of the network. We say that it was available over the previous day, so uh, that's good. And then uh, the agency can look uh, at a few warnings if they want to fix. So they've got some ideas that, has, that are a bit weird. You see they've got accents, so maybe they need to work on that. And we've got also some information, for example, for them to look at. Um, so it was detected that they got an excessive speed between two stops at uh, some point. Uh, so maybe uh, they need to, to work on it as well. So you see like uh, their buses travel at more than 2,000 kilometers uh, according to the schedule. So maybe uh, they need to look at times uh, to, uh, to improve it. So it's not, it's not really bad, but uh, they, they, they should work on it uh, as well. And for uh, GTFSRT, for example, I'm going to show you a validation report. So this feed uh, has uh, a bit more errors. So you can see that uh, we've got uh, a validation. Uh, so stop types were not uh, accurate. So you've got the issue, you've got sample errors. Um, you can download the file when it was actually run. Uh, you can actually uh, run it now. If you want to check uh, the feed right now, you can click the button. Anyone can click the button and make sure that uh, if it is valid or not, it's going to, be, to, to provide a report and they can look at it. And also, we, uh, we show what's inside the, the feed. Uh, for example, GTFSRT is hard to understand uh, for multiple people, so we show like a full text version of it uh, so that people can inspect it if they want uh, and take a closer look uh, at it. I'm going to show you maybe just one last thing. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, we've got a wide range of, uh, uh, of data, and we are in charge of uh, having like a a national database of low emission zones in France saying that you cannot enter this city with this type of vehicle because it's too old or it's, uh, it's, too, um, yeah, it's too old. Uh, it has got uh, two emissions. So you see we, we've got a map, you can click on it, uh, and uh, it's, uh, we've got a, a schema that we define, uh, and we make sure that uh, it is uh, up to date when cities uh, publish a new data or change their legislation, we reflect it. And we uh, have got securities in place to make sure that uh, it's still valid over time. And we act as uh, the second point of contact for our user and producer uh, to make sure that uh, it's easy for them to reuse the data that they need and for producers to, to get the best support they need uh, to, to report on what's uh, uh, available in their city. And yeah, that's, uh, that would be it for me. Thank you very much, Antoine. Also, that I do is a national effort. How do you think this whole uh, quality um, loop having an impact on smaller cities? Yeah, so I guess it's uh, so we act uh, as a country, but uh, we are here to serve the everyone, and especially like smaller agencies or smaller cities. Uh, most of the time, they don't have like a, a large team, a large budget, uh, so they really benefit a lot from our expertise because we. We can give them advices, we can recommend tooling, we can help them. Uh, it's free for them, it's free for everyone, but especially for them. So it's really uh, helpful. Um, and also like uh, for small cities, like it's really critical because you don't have a lot of options. Like uh, if you go into Paris, like it's easy to catch a subway. Uh, but when you go like in a rural place, of course you don't have uh, many options. So it's even more important like to have uh, data available up to date. and. Uh, Etc. Because like uh, the bus, bus yeah, are not going to run every two minutes. They're not in Paris. So if you miss your bus and the uh, next one is in uh, two hours, uh, you're screwed. So it's really important uh, to have like accurate data, especially in this kind of scenario. Uh, Gretchen is uh, director of partnerships with Mobility Data. I was interested in what you were doing to promote sustainable mobility uh, in your jurisdiction, and particularly some of the requirements you have. As well as you said, you have a um, authoritative group that oversees the yeah. compliance. Yeah. Um, right now, 
I'm going to be doing one on NDIP, the interoperability principles, and one of the things you're looking at is how do you enforce and how do you encourage? So I'm curious about how you set that up, how well it's received, and if you think that model could be um, used in other places. Yeah, um, so the French government does a lot of things about uh, mobility, so um, they are in charge of actually creating the infrastructure, trains, backways, uh, giving uh, uh, incentives to to buy a bike or to get an electric vehicle. Uh, so that's one part of the policy. And um, the regulator has got a, so they need to make sure that the mobility sector works in France. So for example, uh, when you want to operate a new train in France, you have to ask for permission. You want to say, I want to run my train between this city and this city, uh, this frequency, etc. And they will look at it if it's not going to create like a economic, uh, um, impact, a negative economic impact, for example, on other or train operators, and then they will give you the authority to run or not, or they will give you like a, a specific authorization. So this is like their main role. And for data, uh, they uh, are looking at uh, like, is it available? Is it up to date? Is it uh, uh, complying with standards? Is it uh, moving in the right direction? Is it going too slow, too fast? Um, are you having a uh, a good enough relationship with the government and with the partners, and if not, they are going to step up uh, to say like uh, you need to get better at that. It's going too slow. Uh, you're doing something illegal for four years, for example, um, and then they will act on it. So it will mean it will not maybe like a, like a, the goal is not to provide penalty like, a, a, like right now. Uh, remove the goal is really to to move with people and to help them. But they are here to step up. It's really it's not possible to work on it, and it's really causing uh, damage to move uh, the country not in the right direction. That answer your question. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Our second panelist is Olivier Warra uh, from Flubert. Well, he's making himself. Um, Again, thank you very much for fun. France is always a, a good inspiration uh, for all of us. Of course it is. How are you today? Great? All right. You good? Excellent. Um, so today's question is leveraging standards. Will it bring much it? And to be honest, I quite disagree. Because people are not changing for standards. They are changing for value, okay? And I don't think changing standards will change people's habits. So this is why I want to talk to you about uh, the mass made in Monaco, because they are quite an uh, interesting approach about mobility and about value, okay? But just before that, a few words about uh, my company, Flaubert, and you won't escape that, for sure. So who in the room doesn't know Flaubert? Raise your hand. Yeah, quite many. But you would probably be surprised because every one of you has already used one of our equipments somewhere in the world. Okay? Because we are present in uh, more than 5,000 cities. It could be for uh, on street park meters, it could be for a ticketing system like in Toronto for the ticket vending machine, for example, or in Laval here in Quebec for the uh, open loop payments. Or we have processed your credit card, and uh, fortunately, we might have done the good check. So I was telling you that there is something very unique in, uh, in Monaco. So um, it's in the south of France, but it's not the sea. In Monaco, there is something very special and that you don't have everywhere. There is this unique alignment, okay? Because a mass without this alignment is just a mess, okay? And in many places where you are, what's happened? You have the governments, you have the cities, probably not the same political party, then you have the public transportation authority, then you have the parking, and then you have private entities and so on. So this mixed alignment, this issue of global governance, is a, a frontier for a mobility, okay? But here in Monaco, um, 
It's not like a dictature, but it's better if you're aligned with the direction the government wants to go. Okay? And this brings a unique opportunity, not just to stay in the mobility area, but to grow and bring value around this. So they have a, a three-year uh, program in terms of implementation of new services. Okay? So the first step one is just regarding public transportation. Step two is to boot means uh, the goal. So why are you moving? Okay? And then how can we combine the mobility and the destination? See step one. So step one is almost like what everybody does when they are talking about uh, mobility as a service. So you take the bus, you take the bike, and here you go, you have a mass. Great, fantastic. Uh, here we have added uh, the park meters also in order to have more services there. So uh, if we talk about uh, some figures there, so Monaco, there are 39,000 people living there. And in addition to that, you have around Monaco, you have like maybe 50,000 people coming to Monaco uh, every day. So, are people uh, in the room been to Monaco before? Yes, a few, okay. So, you know, it's not a huge highway when you go to Monaco, so uh, the congestion there could be maximum anytime. So, today uh, there are 2,000 users, active users, okay, because I don't usually talk about uh, people downloading uh, the app. Maybe the one question is that we all want a mass so we get new riders, okay? And in many cases, we don't know if these are just current riders taking their mobile phone or if these are new riders, okay? And even those two, I don't know. I don't know yet. How can we say that a mass is interesting in terms of, uh, let's say, use? So we have among 8,000 people that have downloaded and used once the application. And what we see is, almost 90% of the people are using just one service, which is probably uh, public transportation. So what's quite interesting is still there are 10% of the people using two services, okay? So in that case, it's one KPI to, to say, okay, there might be something to do, okay? So now let's include uh, chapter two. So what are we going to add? Okay, so in Monaco, that's quite interesting, there is a cinema, there is a stadium, the IS Monaco, and they have touristic buses, and there is a Oceanarium, okay? So the idea is, let's add some new services and see if people are uh, quite interesting with the application and, and if it brings uh, more value. What's more interesting, and in that case, it could be interesting to have standards because all these these are the good guys, okay? These are the bad guys. So first question they ask, how many people are you going to uh, bring me back if I make the effort to come to you, okay? So they are really like, okay. And they don't use GTFS. They use uh, vending systems and so on. So it's not completely uh, a cultural change, okay, to, uh, to do so. So, and uh, step three would be, okay, if you buy your uh, uh, movie ticket on the app, then you have a free bus, okay? So the idea is how can we um, give a, a will to use the public transportation as a combination, okay? This is the idea behind that and see if it works. Just like, you know, in your hotel room, you have the mini bar. It's just like, uh, okay, I'll take it. Even if it's $5 at the bottom. Another step is, okay, if you come to the museum, uh, I mean, Oceanarium with a bus, then you have a shortcut, okay? So, I don't know if this is going to work or not, okay? I don't know yet. But what is quite interesting is in Monaco, they figure out that um, mobility as a service is not an app. It's just a process to bring more value because the value makes people change their habit. We have seen that so many times with the smartphone and other things like that. Also something that could be interesting is, you know, uh, everybody, uh, when you, you buy something to eat, uh, you check the Nutri-Score, like A, B, C, D, E. The best is E, of course, but uh, it's not healthy. Here we have uh, also implemented the uh, movie score, 
which for some people that are interested in knowing their impact on the environment, today you not necessarily know, but with that indicator, you will know what the impact of the choice you made in terms of mobility. Okay. So I'm just finished and I don't know, I don't have the result today. So my proposal to you is, let's see, uh, next year to the second uh, mobility data event for the results. What do you think? Thank you very much. All right. Um, how can the success of Monopass be replicated in a different scale? So uh, I, to be honest, I don't know what the difference with other cases. And Dijon is one good example because in Dijon, there is uh, something specific in terms of uh, governance. In Dijon, same people are managing the transportation, the parking, and so on. So when you have that alignment, then you can make some combination. So uh, I think step one is uh, the governance, okay? You know, when, when people are thinking about the mass, they try to make the big bang. Oh, a huge technology, architecture, and so on. But they are not thinking about the value uh, that is created. And if you know the strategy of Google, they are looking for an app. They call that the toothbrush app. So you use it twice a day, OK? So it's more interesting to go from the ground with the people uh, finding interest in it than making this big bang that is politically interesting but uh, will, less, will not be really used uh, by the end of the day. All right, well, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's meet our third panelist. Right, hello everybody. Okay, so we're talking about how can we leverage data standards for modal shift and climate change. So. Why am I in a position to talk about that? Well, my company, Eto World, we're specialists in transit data and analytics on transit data. And we're going to share a case study today in terms of something we've been doing with the, uh, the UK government. Now, Antoine talked quite a lot about what we've been doing in France with a national access point. There's definitely some parallels here with what we've been doing in, uh, in the UK, but I think there's a subtly different take on it, which hopefully give everybody a kind of rounded view of you know, some of the pros and cons of doing things in a different way and, and so on. So, why am I starting with a picture of a Formula One car? Bit of a strange thing to do at a transit conference. Well, I think there are some parallels here because I think as an industry, I think we're in a race. So we're in a race to make transport sustainable. We're in a race to make transport efficient. And in order to do that, we're in a race to persuade people to use public transit rather than their cars and less sustainable means. So if we Establish that we are in a bit of a, a race and we start to think about, well, what happens in Formula One? How do, how do people make the cars go quicker? And is it a good example of continuous improvement, for example? So if you were to race a Formula One car in the first race of a season and win that race and you did nothing to it in terms of improving it throughout the season and you raced it in the last race, you would come last because things develop that quickly in Formula One. Now, how do people do that in Formula One? Well, they do it that quickly by the use of data. So there's 500 sensors on each car in a Formula One race, and they're measuring everything about it so they can improve that. Now, do they have a silver bullet that makes that car go incredibly quicker from one race to the next? Absolutely not. But do they improve absolutely everything a little bit? Yes, they do. And they call that the aggregation of marginal gains. And if we start to think about that, we can start to think about perhaps how the quality of the data that we have within the transit industry can actually help with some of the goals that we're, that we're looking for. So how can we do this? If we start with high quality and reliable data, I think there's two tracks we can think about in terms of benefits for that. So one is in passenger information. So um, I think you know, Oliver was saying a, a similar thing. You need to be able to, passengers need to be confident in their journey planning. So they need to have confidence that when a journey is laid out in front of them, um, it's going to be the right journey for them and it's going to be uh, something that is reliable for them. And when they're on that journey, they also need to be confident whilst they're riding that if something happens, they're going to get informed by that. So we need to give them information on disruption. And if we can do those two things, they're going to have a good passenger experience, which means that probably they're more inclined to use that service again 
the next time and we're going to build our confidence and we're going to get increased ridership. But I think it's tempting when we think of data standards and data quality to purely think of that side of the, of the equation, really, in terms of passenger information. But actually, there's something equally important on the other side, which is about the ability for transit agencies and authorities to make really good operational decisions based on the quality of the data that they've got. And if they can get a clear operational view of performance, it actually means they can make high-quality data-driven network decisions as opposed to decisions made on hearsay or people standing at bus stops with clipboards collecting data that may or may not be correct. And so if we can take ourselves down that track as well, that also can contribute to a good passenger experience because the network is working more efficiently, and then both those things together can increase ridership. And this is where we can start to see a bit of a link potentially between the quality of the data and hence the standards that we use to generate that data and what we want, which is increased ridership, and hence some escape from some of this uh, you know, relentless move towards non-sustainable living. So what kind of clues are there then in terms of what can we do as an industry to help that transition and to help that high quality data? Well, first of all, we can think about open data. We've heard quite a lot about that in some of the other sessions today. So one of the early examples of this actually was in London quite a number of years ago. And Deloitte did a report in 2017 after Transport for London had decided to open up their data so that lots and lots of app developers could use it, use it for whatever purposes they wanted. And they reported that about 500 jobs had been created in an innovation ecosystem. There'd been about 130 million pounds in economic benefit for London uh, and TFL. And that was not just in the jobs created, but also the passengers in terms of the efficiency of the transit network and how quickly they could get to where they wanted to go and the lack of delays. And over 40% of Londoners by that point were using over, using one of 600 apps, and about 80% were using TFL's website. So that's um, all interesting things. Now, can we draw a, a connection between this and actually increased ridership? Well, look, I, I'd love to be able to, but I think like Oliver, I don't know the answer to that. I can't, I can't say that's definitely true. But what is interesting is if we look at the 10 years prior to COVID, and we look at the UK as a whole, I think bus ridership in the UK dropped by about 11%. But in London, it dropped by only 1.4%. Now, is that due to the fact that they opened up their data entirely? I suspect not. But is it a contributing factor? Perhaps it is. And also, they've done some work to look at uh, routes where they offered real-time passenger information. So, you know, where they showed what time the next bus was going to arrive. And they got 2% increase in ridership on those routes compared with the ones where they weren't showing that information. Now, again, there could be other factors at play, but it's a clue. So if you can do that in London, could we do that at a national level? Now, that clearly is quite a tricky thing to do. So you have to be pretty certain that you want to do that because there's a lot of problems to solve. Um, and in order to examine why the British government wanted to do that, we're going to hear from Mira Nayar. Um, who's head of open data there. We've been working with Ito World, who have been delivering a new digital service, the Bus Open Data Service, which delivers on our new legal requirements for bus operators in England to openly publish timetables, spurs and location data. We decided to legally require this of bus operators because we could see that in areas that chose to open this data, app developers were able to deliver solutions such as CityMapper, which helped people make that transition from private transport to public transport. In the UK, in the last three decades, we've reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by 43%. In energy alone, emissions have been reduced by approximately 40%. However, in transport, we've only really reduced our emissions by 3%. Private vehicles, SUVs, and motorcycles account for 47% of all greenhouse gas emissions related to transport, and transport-related emissions account for 16% of all emissions globally. So there's a real incentive for us to work together to deliver transport decarbonisation. For passengers to feel that they can leave their cars at home and make the switch to public transportation, they need to feel the same immediacy and convenience benefits of using public transportation. So they need to know that they can start and end their journey on public transport and they need certainty about how much it will cost. Journey planning data and solutions and multimodal ticketing 
are the two building blocks for creating an integrated public transport system that people can utilise. And so that's why we've decided to legally require operators to openly publish this data and why we've been working with Eto World to enable operators to publish the data and app developers to utilise it. OK, so there we heard from Mira about the motivations there of the government to do this. And it's not to be taken lightly. This is, this is quite a big, thing to, uh, a big thing to do. So the initiative she's talking about is called the Bus Open Data Service. Um, and basically, this is about making the schedule, real-time, and fares information openly available at a national level. So we're talking about 600 agencies in North American language or, or operators in, in UK language um, and about 26,000 vehicles. And this is not just about the passenger information side of things, as we said. This is about the digital transformation to the way the government deals with uh, transit um, and also the wider industry. So this has been going for just over a year now. About 85% of vehicles' real-time data are now regularly available. And what's interesting, I was interested to see Antoine talk about what, what they've done there. And clearly there you've got a lot of feeds across the country. You're making it really easy for people to get at those feeds. I think that's one way of doing things. Interestingly, the UK government decided to go down a, a slightly different route, which is actually to aggregate all of those feeds into a single source to make it a little bit more straightforward for people to build apps and so on. Now, there are clearly pros and cons of, of, of both of those, but it's just interesting there that there's a, a slight diversion there between the, the ways that's, uh, the way that's been done. So that's what, that's what BODS is. So how far have we got with it? Well, this is just a little animation just to talk about how that's grown over the last uh, year, and, uh, year and a quarter or so. <laughs> Okay, so you can see there how the, the data has grown. You'll imagine, you know, as you might imagine, the, the large spikes there are in the, the large urban areas. But you'll notice in the bottom right there that London were actually quite late to contribute the data to BODS, but that's now in uh, the BODS database. And obviously that's making it even more useful for, uh, for application developers. So if we think about that as a, you know, something that's quite a large scale thing to do, um, and we think about you know, how hard that was to do, and I'll come on to some of the challenges in a, in a second. Let's just dig, dig a little bit deeper on the motivations, just going beyond what Mira said about the sort of top level motivations. So she did talk very clearly about the importance of the passenger experience here. Um, and there's a clear hypothesis there that more accurate passenger information encourages use of transit and saves time and money for, for passengers. Are there huge numbers of massive proof points that can absolutely concretely draw that conclusion? There are some around, but it's quite hard to do definitively, but I think it's a reasonable assumption. Then there are economic benefits. So first of all, there's an economic benefit in terms of enabling an industry for people to create value out of doing these kinds of apps. And we've heard about all sorts of those today. But interestingly, what we're also doing here is making tools and uh, data available at a national level which means it doesn't have to be done at a regional level. So there's an economic benefit there that that money doesn't need to be spent several times over. And then finally, there's a really important aspect here in terms of improved governance. So this is governance at a local level. So in terms of dialogue between, say, an agency and, a, and an, op uh, sorry, an operator and an authority in a particular region, but also, almost more importantly for the government, a national level for the first time they can see what's actually happening. So what's the scale that's been achieved? So we talked about the number of buses, the number of operators. Um, like Antoine, there's, uh, there's a lot of data quality tests that are run on every data set because we want to make sure that it's good quality data. We've now got about 1,200 data consumers using this. Um, that's gone up hugely since I talked about this maybe six months ago. I think that figure was about 600. Um, and then the number of API hits per day is also growing hugely. 
So now we're standing at about two and a half million a day, and that was literally a few hundred thousand only a few months, few months ago. So this is really growing very, uh, very quickly. So what about the other thing then that we talked about on the left-hand side in terms of use of, you know, improving operational decisions through use of data? So in addition to BODs, what Mira asked us to do also was to produce something called Analyze Bus Open Data. So this builds on the data that has been contributed, but it offers a user interface for regional authorities, regional operators, so all of, all of those people who are contributing data and looking at data, but also the government as well, to actually look at things like on-time performance to get a completely holistic view about what is going on in the network. And I think this sets things up to the next level, really. There was a time when you know, a local operator would be talking to a local authority, and they'd spend most of the time arguing about whether they were both looking at the same data, rather than thinking about what was the data telling them, what insight could they get from it, and what improvements could be made to a network as a result. So this really elevates things to get the skills of the people who are looking at these things to apply their brains to how to make positive changes, as opposed to simply having to wrestle with changes with the underlying data. And so now, across the UK, we have over 230 local authorities and bus operators using this interface to do their on-time performance analysis to ensure that the service that's provided nationally is on track, but also that they can use that to improve performance as well. And as the UK tries to get people back onto buses through the, uh, the Bus Back Better campaign, then this is proving to be a really important tool for the local authorities to be able to, to do that. So how do we do that? I won't dwell on the, on the tech here, but you know, like Antoine, we have uh, data publishers on one side, we have data consumers on the other, and a lot of the tech in between is really trying to make it as simple as possible for those people to collaborate um, and to really get ease of use of the data. And I can't overemphasize enough, this is not just a tech problem. It's not just a policy problem. It's not just a standards problem. It's a, it's a mixture of all those things. And anybody who's been involved in data standards, and this is an audience that's as educated as, as any, will know that there is a massive job to do here. You can't just identify that GTFS is enough to do the job. You have to work on what are the profiles that you're going to use. You need to get the operators comfortable to contribute the data. So there was an awful lot of work that KPMG did to talk to the operators, talk to the data consumers, get the operators comfortable about what the consumers were going to do with the data, then to agree what the standards were and to make those implementable by a completely massive range, you know, as Antoine was saying, of anything from large to small operators and um, large to small consumers as well. So just a, a, a massive amount of effort there over and above the pure, the pure tech. We asked Mira to say, well, look, this has been up and running for you know, a year and a half. What, what have you learned and what would you say to anybody who was going to do a similar thing? So she said three things, really. So she said that, first of all, she found it completely fundamental to understand the stakeholders. So these are the consumers and the publishers to enable trust and collaboration and be very careful with the standards. And that's, that's really fundamental. She then talked about actually fostering innovation from the start. So she, she talked about uh, the fintech industry, for example. And she almost wishes that what she'd done is not just laid the groundwork to enable an innovative group of people to, you know, to, to flourish and to, to create apps, but actually that the government had taken a positive step to perhaps even actively create that ecosystem themselves, which they haven't done. But she, you know, she certainly prompts people to think about that if they're thinking about doing this elsewhere. And finally, you know, she's absolutely convinced that having set out with a vision that this was about improving the quality of passenger information for all the things we talked about at the beginning, the more that she's got into it and the more she's seen the success of ABOD, that actually the operational use of the data is just as important as the passenger information side of things. Okay, that's all I wanted to, uh, all I wanted to say. Thank you.